Greetings, friends, in Jerusalem. Greetings from the city with the two different time zones, which is confusing us, but is also confusing the rest of the world. So it's a pleasure to be with you. This is a for us. Many of you have heard the sad news of the loss um, of our dear friend, Robert Asari. So please, for the people who know Robert, um, or um, he had a very big role in establishing Canada and has taken the role of leadership for so many different years. Um, many of his kids who have lived in Palestine and also have served um, and volunteered at our So we'd appreciate your prayers and your thoughts towards the family. Um, you know, it's for people who are watching the news, you know how problematic the country is. I mean, apart and then the discrimination that many Palestinian citizens of Israel are facing. There is also a threat on the, I mean, it is, it's on the democratic, I mean, it's, it's really fully democratic, but it's, uh, there's internal issues, crisis well, with demonstrations, M mainly most of the Palestinian or Israeli Arab, Israeli Palestinian citizens of Israel have not been part of this discussion and have not been joining it because it is it's already has not been a democracy. So worry about the system, the system's not working. But uh, everybody is watching as it's uh, yesterday was the biggest strike um, ever in, the, um, in Israel. But a part of that, um, uh, we're very, uh, we're, I'm very happy that we have a wonderful speaker today with us. Um, Hanin, are you with us? I don't know if you're able to. Yes, Hanin is here, but she's unable to unmute herself. Hanin? Yes. Hi, thank um, you. Um, thank you for being with us. And actually, Hanin is from Nazareth. At least part of her is from Nazareth. But she's actually from Brussels. You're making today. You're the first speaker with us that would join us from Brussels. Um, so, Piki Hanin. Thank you, Amr. Um... Um, um, Hanin, um, it's what we usually do as part of the tradition at Sabil. We ask people um, to introduce themselves, the speakers. So I'm sorry, there's a lot of beeping problems with people getting into the meeting. Um, but with the time zone, you understand. I totally understand. I think it's still quite impressive that we managed to do it with the like changing time zones. I think it's an achievement in itself uh, that we that we hear. But uh, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and thank you so much for uh, inviting me to speak with you today and uh, introduce uh, myself and the organization that I uh, work with. Uh, so like Omar said, my name is Hanin. Uh, I am um, an advocacy officer with the Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy. We are a Palestinian organization based in Palestine. Um, we're a non-governmental and an independent organization um, where our larger aim and objective is usually to shift discourse and narrative on Palestine um, with various social movements and, um, and decision makers around the world. And we do this through various ways, through engagements, um, uh, through advocacy work and campaigns, but uh, also on social media. And we have actually uh, a social media platform, which is called Rabbit uh, in English, but it, the word means Rabbit in Arabic, uh, which is actually a link, but there's actually a few meanings for it. Um, but it is a digital space that we created uh, for Palestine by Palestinians, um, where we share or we, we produce and we share informative, um, educational and uh, intersectional content on our collective struggle uh, for liberation. Uh, and you will see throughout my presentation that um, our advocacy and digital work uh, comes together and intersects, and this is one of the ways we uh, do advocacy, um, which ends up being like mobilizing at the grassroots level, but also uh, mobilizing digitally for Palestine. Um, so, um, yeah. Hanin, you are from from Nazareth, but you you grew up in Jerusalem, right? We were chatting before. 
Yes, yeah. So I uh, I was saying earlier that um, uh, my dad is from Yaffa and my mother is from Nazareth, but I was born and raised in Jerusalem. Uh, and now I live in Brussels. <laughs> so, so for how long have you been living in Brussels? Uh, not long, just for a year. So yeah, I'm still... So you still moved because of the job or it was something like... Was a coincidence you applied to the job while you were in uh, I'm here for work, yes, mostly for work. Um, uh, I think we a lot of Palestinian organizations are currently uh, not relocating, but are trying to open uh, a branch or an office in Europe uh, to ensure continuation of the work. As you might have heard, there's many Palestinian organizations under attack uh, or criminalized or uh, have been closed uh, because their work is so effective and Israel is afraid of uh, the type of work that they're doing and documenting violations and advocating for accountability. So one way to ensure that the work continues is by opening a branch in Europe, um, which is one way to resist uh, the occupation. Um, we, um... We've never addressed this, so I'd like, and I think many of our European friends are aware of it, but yeah. what specifically Brussels, like there's so many European cities, what's what's the importance of Brussels for people? Uh, for Brussels, well, the proximity to the EU institutions and uh, the European Parliament, um, there's a lot of the advocacy is directed at the EU level. Um, so obviously being based uh, in person in a city like this is much easier to navigate it. Um, I think there's a lot of dynamics actually to why also because some international organizations that work on Palestine don't necessarily represent the Palestinian narrative that accurately or take the lead sometimes at the EU level that is not aligned to many voices. So this way we can just go meet them, meet the parliamentarians or the commissioners ourselves. I mean, it's not always the nicest meetings uh, to meet uh, parliamentarians that are very hostile or, um, uh, I mean, some of them are great and are our allies and we depend on them so much and they depend on us a lot. Uh, and without them, it would like work at the EU level wouldn't have been um, like progress wouldn't have been possible. I mean, I don't know if to call it progress because also the EU is becoming a space that's very difficult to uh, push for anything. But of course, we continue to challenge it and challenge its official position um, all the time. But uh, yeah, I think it's mostly for the proximity to the EU institutions. Also, there is a strong um, civil society here based, Belgian civil society, uh, that is active on Palestine, um, and they're doing a great job. And technically, from Brussels, you can get to anywhere, for, to Amsterdam, to Paris, and uh, to Berlin, with just a train ride, so it, it's convenient. <laughs> and uh, I think they have very good chocolate. Uh, this is what I hear, at least. Yeah, that's, of course, of course. Of so um, we're we're looking forward to hear um, uh, to hear you, Hanin. So um, I've made you co-host. If you're gonna share a PowerPoint or just um, no PowerPoint, then we're looking forward. Um, I think I I don't have a PowerPoint with me today. And that's fine. That's fine. I just yeah. okay. Uh, Yes, so today I will basically um, present to you a bit our work, and I will talk a bit about our approach um and the ethos of the organization and later i'll give you like a few examples and the type of advocacy and campaigns that uh, we are involved in um so i as i had started mentioning but uh, we are a very small organization um and uh um we we but we really mirror the situation or the predicament of the palestinian people so uh, meaning that our team is very spread out around the world. Some of us are in Palestine, including in Gaza, Jerusalem, uh, and Ramallah, and others are from the Palestinian diaspora, such as in Germany, Italy, um, and the US. So somehow we're all composed of the Palestinian social fabric, but with different experiences on what it means to be uh, a Palestinian today. Um, and I think in itself, it's a statement to our unity as a people and um, 
uh, and that Palestine a reminder that Palestinians are not just those that were occupied in 67 or um, uh, in the OPT, but that we are a much larger community, uh, much, much, much larger. <laughs> so yeah, it is very telling how we managed to manage to come together even after uh, 75 years of the Nakba. And of course, I mean the ongoing Nakba, because otherwise we would be all of us uh, in Palestine today. Um, so, uh, the work that we do, whether through like advocacy or campaigns, um, is first and foremost, like I mentioned earlier, uh, with the aim to shift discourse and policy on Palestine. And one of the most important ways we do that uh, is by centering Palestinian voices and narratives from the younger generation. Uh, and this is important because we perceive that the Palestinian leadership today in whichever locality it is, uh, has failed us miserably in representing the aspiration of our people. Um, and in many ways, on the contrary, it helped uh, promote our fragmentation that was imposed on us uh, as a people. So they chose this rather than um, a core narrative that is much more inclusive. Um, uh, yeah, basically, that uh, they ended up promoting our fragmentation. Um, so the younger generation of today, as you may have seen in the past few years, um, uh, they're much more uh, vocal or much more fearless um, and are not necessarily afraid of confrontation and from calling out the, occup the occupier um, uh, as it is, uh, an apartheid regime that is driven by settler colonialism. Uh, and I'm sure you have heard through meetings here or elsewhere that this framework is becoming much more prevalent or much more used than before. Um, and it's endorsed by organizations such as uh, Amnesty International uh, Human Rights, which is the latest report by Amnesty was last year. Um, Human Rights Watch, UN Esqua, and the UN Special Rapporteur in Palestine. Uh, Francesca Albanese and um, yeah so these are all evidence of the of uh, shifting the discourse of the discourse being shifted on Palestine right and demanding accountability this type of framework was not possible a few years ago uh, but it would have this wouldn't have been possible anyways without the um, the efforts and the advocacy work of the Palestinian civil society for decades um, push, uh, calling for accountability and documenting crimes and uh, uh, trying to push the narrative. So it did not happen overnight uh, or did not happen just because it's a trend or something, but there was a lot of work that took place before that. A lot of people, um, human rights activists and uh, researchers were harassed, they were killed, they were uh, um, uh, arrested because of this type of work and we're still under attack as uh, we had just said why Palestinian uh, civil society are trying to open branches elsewhere to ensure that their work continues um, so yeah this is more about how that what is our approach and how we look at things we take it very seriously and how we want to center a framework that uh, captures the reality that we live under um and that uh, uh and this is how we approach our work wherever whatever we do basically um so our so in our advocacy engagement um with the policy makers and decision makers particularly at the uh, in europe but also at the eu level and member states uh, as you may know the main uh, framework that is used or the main framework that is uh uh, how to say, um, uh, supported, remains the two-state solution, uh, which is a discourse that is still accepted, that is still being used to this very day. So through our engagements and briefings with parliamentarians uh, and decision makers, uh, our work is mostly to challenge that position by exposing uh, uh, the complicity and inv involvement of EU governments for example, in uh, the illegal settlement enterprise, um, in how uh, their support fuels annexation by continuing to make business and profit uh, from stolen Palestinian land, 
strengthening diplomatic, military, trade relations at the expense of the Palestinian people. So these are just examples by how, you know, business continues as usual with Israel, um, uh, despite its uh, record of human rights violations and war crimes, which means that actually they, they enjoy impunity um, and that uh, if anything, with, with more deals or with more um, uh, diplomatic support, they feel that it's okay to, to commit such crimes. It's okay to expel Palestinians or continue with the colonial project as it is. Um, so, for example, military relations uh, in the past year, there's a lot of military deals that have been uh, made between European governments and Israel, um, where Israel exports like harmful uh, military equipment and tech, which is marketed as tested on Palestinians and then made for profits elsewhere in Europe uh, and the world. Um, so these military deals are profitable for Israel, but it actually, it, to be more specific, it makes the ongoing military occupation of the Palestinians as a profitable project for the um, uh, for the Israeli regime. So this is an, an example of, of uh, how EU governments uh, are completely entrenched in the violations uh, and are complicit in the in the violations against the Palestinian people. Uh, and the most recent like uh, deals happened with uh, uh, Sweden uh, with the Elbit system, uh, which is very well known. Um, with Italy as well, where Israel trains the Italian police uh, and France as well, and of course, Germany recently. Um, and the a war on Ukraine has made it, uh, has made profit much more possible for Israel's military um, alliance or military complex. Um, so this is one example. Um, another example that I wanted to talk about is more to show you how our advocacy works, uh, work um, is done, for example, and then how it connects to the digital mobilization, because a lot of what we do um, uh, on advocacy, which is through meetings and engagements, is then translated into digital content to expand the conversation and make sure that um, people are much more aware of what is happening and what type of advocacy we're doing. Um, also, I apologize for my if my email is exploding in the background. Uh, um, I apologize for that. Uh, so yes, I don't know if you have heard, but recently, um, uh, uh, Israel and the EU uh, renewed the EU Israel Association uh, Association Council, which is basically. Um, a council where they uh, jointly promote or jointly strengthen uh, diplomatic relations, military, uh, science, and the health, uh, in the sci science and health fields, uh, which is basically to bring more cooperation to uh, by like to each other. Um, and the reason why this council was uh, being pushed uh, was because uh, there was the previous Israeli government was headed by Lapid, um, which was seen as a much more liberal, much more centrist uh, prime minister than the, the fascist uh, government that uh, exists now. But not to make this differentiation differentiation very. Um, uh, explicit because at the end of the day, ask any Palestinians, they will tell you that it doesn't matter who is in, in the government. Um, we're still under uh, apartheid and we're still under a systematic, uh, uh, a system that uh, uh, um, violates our rights and oppresses us regularly. But, um, and particularly under Lapid's tenure, uh, if you might have known, but despite people celebrating him as someone who was much against violence or um, um, or much more centrist than the other previous governments, uh, 2022 was the deadliest year for Palestinians um, in, a, in the past decades. Uh, so it, it's in itself tells a lot about, it doesn't matter who's in government actually. 
so that council, um, it was announced that it will be, it, it was announced that it will be renewed uh, in the summer of 2022. Um, and the decision to renew that was also preceded by a new gas deal, uh, which was supported by, which was signed by Israel, the EU and Egypt. And if you know, the idea behind it was to replace Russian gas following its invasion of Ukraine with alternative gas. Um, so it's irony at its best when you cannot replace the gas of one aggressor with another aggressor like Israel. So not to mention that or also relevant to today's uh, theme is that this gas is actually stolen given that it's located off the shore of the occupied Gaza Strip. Uh, which Israel imposes siege and isolation for 15 years. Um, so the announcement of the decision to renew this council was an, it was announced during a period where, where Palestinians were experiencing uh, intensification of attacks. Uh, we had just witnessed the, uh, the killing of Shirin Abu Akli in the summer, which was televised. Uh, war crime, um, and to this day, her family and Palestinians call for accountability, and no one has been uh, detained, and no investigation was opened, um, and um, uh, the, the family still pursues justice for her killing. Uh, there was uh, numerous invasions and military raids by the occupation forces on the Palestinian cities like Nablus and refugee camps in Nablus that killed scores of Palestinians. Uh, there was another military assault that was headed actually by Lapid's government in the summer um, as a way to campaign for more votes is basically by saying who can kill more Palestinians. At, uh, uh, and the last but not least was also the closure uh, of six Palestinian uh, offices, uh, six Palestinian CSOs, civil society organizations, uh, as part of the attack on the Palestinian civil society. This was this came after the criminalization under the anti-terrorism law. Um, so the, this was the context of how when the EU decided that it's a good time to <laughs> strengthen relations with Israel. I mean, this is just during that period, like not to mention that there was loads of evidence from uh, from decades ago that would have been relevant to be like, no, you should hold, hold Israel accountable before any continuing or carrying uh, uh, or strengthening relations. Um, so they very much like to bury their heads in the sand um, and not hear about uh, violations with Palestinian, of Palestinians, especially when they need um, gas and when they need uh, military equipment etc um so what we decided to do basically is that um uh, we we coordinated among the palestinian civil society and we decided that we want to be heard uh, uh, by the uh, european ministries of foreign affairs before they go ahead with the association council as we said that you cannot go ahead without hearing what we have to say. Um, so we had written a letter where we uh, address uh, the head of the MFAs and request to meet with them uh, and to be heard. Um, and in the meeting, they accepted to have the meeting and they invited us. And uh, uh, we were joined by a number of representatives of the Palestinian civil society. And we challenged their position um and why you can't already go ahead with this council because israel has violated the conditions a long time ago um it was i mean i'm not saying it's an achievement and i think you might know now following the palestinian situation it's very difficult to talk about achievements because there's nothing short term that is like a win it's always we're building an infrastructure to to ensure that um we're pushing something larger than that, Lenny. Uh, so of course the outcome was that they went ahead with the association council, but we made our her, uh, our voice heard. And one way to do that is not just through the meeting with the MFA. We decided to do uh, a social media campaign or a social media storm, or a, uh, a day of action, where we translated our demands into graphics and visuals. Uh, with, we have a graphic designer in our team, which is one way we use to communicate our messages through 
um, visually in, in something that is more attractive and people that like gravitate towards reading and then they're like more interested in following it. Um, and we share a social media toolkit with our partners, uh, colleagues and networks. Uh, so we campaign that day online to ensure that our demands or voices are heard. Um, and that campaign online that we did reached around 100,000 uh, engagements. Um, 100, sorry, I'm bad with my... <laughs> um, uh, meet Alf, صح? Okay. Yes, 100,000. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, yeah, this is just a testament to how the social media is being used a lot as a alternative to mainstream media right because our voices are always dismissed always omitted from the conversation uh, they went ahead with the council as if nothing has happened uh, and it's basically green lighting more crimes more violations but we ensure that the conversation online and people can follow it and they are educated on how the complicity is being enacted right otherwise how would they know that the eu isn't complicit with such crimes um so this was uh one campaign that we did um uh, i'm just looking at the time and bearing in mind what else i can share with you but i, I mean we have some questions for you honey this is the this is really inspiring okay. i mean one of the most yes. Uh, so yes we have questions we'd like to ask some questions before we know that you have to leave like in the coming 20 minutes um yeah um should i go ahead with the questions now or maybe if i i have a bit one more yeah point. please just uh, yeah so it's uh, yeah. be aware of the time so i will share maybe in the uh, q a session if you have any questions about uh, other campaigns or uh, that we're doing but i one way i wanted to also just um say the transition basically that uh to uh, how we use social media and uh, digital content production um we that we yes as i mentioned is earlier this is one way that we use it to translate our campaigns and advocacy demands into the digital digital content content and then we can expand the conversation uh to a bigger audience and mobilize people uh on different aspects uh of the discourse in palestine um and uh, this is one way we found that it's alternative to mainstream media the, that I mentioned that usually like omits Palestinian voices and uh, depicts a problematic picture, a harmful picture on Palestine. Um, so a lot of our media will share it with you, but we had developed a tool called 10 Things to Remember When Reporting on Palestine which is a guidelines that we created for reporters, journalists, uh, and editors uh which a lot of their uh, accuracy integrity uh, integrity and um ethical reporting is is very important and integral to uh how people then perceive the palestinian question or how they uh, understand the reality um specifically when it comes to asymmetrical power dynamics you can't report on palestine without mentioning that there is a military occupation or that there is um, uh, an occupied people an occupier I will share the um, guidelines with you in the chat uh, if I find it. Is it on the website? Yes. Maybe, yeah, maybe Ryan, if you can find it on the website, that would be helpful. Oh, it is already shared. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, yeah, and this is it for now. I have other tools that we had developed that would be interesting to share with you particularly if you wanted to organize an event on palestine but uh, uh, which is a virtual reality tool that we developed um uh for um for people who cannot visit palestine to visit it on a, online uh, we had filmed videos uh, tours of palestinian cities uh, and villages uh, 360 videos where Palestinian activists uh, locally would show us around their city and showcase what apartheid looks looks like in their own context. Um, and then uh, uh, the idea is basically that we curate a Palestine tour where people can watch it from distance and experience Palestine 
Um, mm. And he hear from the younger generation about how they depict it, how they're resisting the occupation. Um, and it's all on YouTube. Um, and uh, if you wish to organize an event, a VR event, I'm happy to walk you through the step, uh, through the steps in setting up a VR a VR booth um, for your network or for your organization. Uh, um, this is in um, you do the VR tours, the virtual tours in every city um, in Palestine, like like Gaza, West Bank, inside Israel. You do the whole thing, or specific? yes. So we have a selection of uh, tours from uh, Gaza, Jerusalem, uh, uh, Yaffa uh, in 48, uh, Khan al-Ahmar, Msafir Yatta. We have new videos from Msafir Yatta, um, which we had recorded giving the, um, the situation right now where the communities are under a uh, threat of expulsion. Um, we have also Nabi Saleh, uh, the mm. time of Ahd al-Tamimi, um, Ramallah. So if we want to organize one of these tours, we can do. Like, it's, they're done, they're already pre-recorded, and what we do is just... Yes, send... there's, yeah, they're pre-recorded. They're all in, on YouTube. I can send you, I will share with you the material um, uh, uh, that you can share it with the network. But you can watch them or watch them on YouTube through 360, like by uh, like going through the screen. Like you can tap on the screen and move it around. Very interactive and nice. Yeah, and there's an option also to watch them with the with the headset and goggles, which is a very immersive experience to uh, to try. Uh, so this is just an interactive experience for people to 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 know Palestine and to uh, be more involved, especially. How long are the videos? Um, so we will make a playlist. It depends which type of videos you want to watch, but like the videos are short and they jump from one, like it's a, a playlist that plays one video after the other. So it depends on like we can customize, like if you want to focus, for example, only on Gaza, we will make a playlist with the videos on Gaza. Um, or if you want to talk about a certain theme, like we can... So as, as a group, we can, like, for example, like for our Sabil Kumi events, we could do like a special event with you on this, yes? Uh, yes, I mean, it's it's better to do it in person. I think it's much more nicer. Um, um, but we can also try to do it online. Um, but I think, uh, I don't know, technically, it's better to do it online for like a nicer experience, but uh, I so can... We will explore this uh, more. Um, I mean, w one of the things is that it is, it's one of the realities of uh, of us Palestinians, sadly, that we, although we're, we're a small group of people in a small piece of land, we've been divided into different identities. Yeah. So there's the group who live in Gaza, there's the group in Jerusalem, there's the groups in the West Bank, area A, B, C. D, I don't know, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Who live inside Israel. So it's like we're a mixture of identities and, and each identity has its own problems. But what I like very, uh, what's very positive of your talk is that you're bring that your organization, your work is people from different backgrounds are advocating as one voice, as one concern. Do you feel, uh, is this unique um, in your organization or that's, you, we could generalize that this is how the new generation is becoming? Uh, I feel that this is uh, one way how the younger generation is um, heading towards. I mean, I, I think if you know, for example, in the Unity Intifada in 2021, this was one of the biggest achievements that uh, 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 happened was that Palestinians defied fragmentations within seconds, right? The fragmentation that was imposed on us for decades walls, ID systems, uh, refusing family reunification, like racist policies, discrimination, expulsion, all of this for us to not to be fragmented and isolated because this is how the, um, the Israeli state can exist. Otherwise it cannot exist, right? It needs to be mm. a Jewish majority. This is a way to ensure Jewish supremacy over the Palestinian people from the entirety of the region. So in, in 2021, there was a buildup, of course, that led to, to those events. There was the um, Great March of Return that happened uh, in 2018, uh, the um, 
uh, and uh, the primary plan as well, and then the the Sheikh Jarrah, the case of the mm. Sheikh Jarrah families, which it happened also by utilizing the social media. Yeah, how people know knew about Sheikh Jarrah. No one heard of Sheikh Jarrah before, and un until they started seeing the content online, and people were outraged. You know, twenty eight families um, under threat of expulsion to allow for Jewish Israeli settlers to um, come from the US and live a, uh, and live in a Palestinian home in Jerusalem. This is part of the demographic engineering. So I think- Shirin Abu Akhle also, there was like another um, feeling of solidarity on a nation level. Um, so it seems that it is becoming more um, rather than a phenomenon, a reality that people come together whenever there is a challenge um, that is facing us. Yes, definitely. Yani, I think Shirin Abu Akli, we all grew up listening to her voice uh, wherever we, in, we were, like in 48 Palestine, people watched Shirin Abu Akli in, in Gaza and uh, in the occupied West Bank and elsewhere. People recognize her voice. So her death or her not death, her killing was hard on, on, on so many people. Yani. Uh, it's very sad, even like such a high profile person, nothing happens with a US citizen yeah. and with, actions with thousands of journalists and with a career and very sad. I mean, it is it's the ethical standards of the world. It's so sad. Um, yeah. but I want to ask you, there's a very interesting question in the chat. Um, yes. Do you have a mapping of uh, political parties in Europe? Who is who? Um, who votes usually pro pro Palestinian rights and who usually advocates on behalf of Israel? Do you have like a mapping to know who's who? And do you have also a historical record on the voting. Um, um, I mean the voting. Uh, I mean on the historical voting positions of these political parties. Uh, this is a. Uh, so the the question is for Europe in general or specific countries because I think there's so much to say about each country. Uh, uh, but I mean, it is if this has been done. I mean, in Europe in general or for specific countries. I mean, the, the mapping for us, like as an advocacy organization, that works. No, for for like, do we know like, if, let's say in 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 Belgium, um, which are the political parties that are usually in um, are in um, the. And how do they usually vote when it comes to Palestine Israel issues? I mean, uh, I think it varies from country to country, to be honest. But for example, Belgium, um, uh, of course, that uh, the parties that are most uh, likely that are most vocal on Palestine are the Green parties and the Workers parties. Uh, in Belgium, they regularly mainly own... left left parties. Yes. 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 Mainly left. The we are not very famous among the right wing. Uh, they don't really like us. They don't know what yeah. they're missing. We're we're really. Yeah, right. I know <laughs> it's their loss, but okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, definitely, I would say uh, left. It's more the progressive circles, but of course, there's still even within the progressive circle itself in Europe uh, and in each uh, member state, there's still a bit there's the gap still exists. So there's still work to be done within that circle in itself because um, a lot of them still, for example, reiterate this uh, the two state solution, um, and uh, e like this is still this is. While I know they're working hard and like they're doing their best to push slowly against like a harmful narrative and harmful agreements and deals with Israel, um, at the same time it's still problematic. But uh, it's a long, a long-term um, uh, objective. Uh, but it it varies uh, like in each country. I mean, um, it it would it depend. But like for example, in the recent. Um, uh, you and uh, if you have seen there was there were a vote uh, to write an opinion an advisory opinion on the prolonged occupation of the Palestinian uh, people uh, there was a vote whether this advisory opinion will be carried or not and surprisingly there were a few countries that uh, uh, voted yes such as uh, France um, Belgium and uh, uh, there was another one that was surprising, maybe the Netherlands, I'm, if I'm not sure. Um, 
uh, that even by saying that, yes, they just want to have an opinion whether Israel is committing a crime or not, uh, it backlashed, of course, and Israel uh, flipped out. But um, the, yes, there's a few that are like moving somehow, but like they're like on the verge all the time. So it's not really um, enough, unfortunately. Um, you've had you've mentioned that, that there was a campaign to expose you and uh, um, cooperation with Israel when it comes to the selling of arms and purchase of arms. Um, how did this campaign go? Uh, so we were involved in a few campaigns in exposing like the uh, complicity with the. Um, uh, actually with the illegal settlement enterprise that was the most recent campaign with the military like military alliances this is something that we will focus on in the coming year because we think there's a very strong links then to talk how it, it's like how the uh, alliances with israel are very harmful not just in palestine but elsewhere right when you have um uh, the, when you're exporting the military complex to countries in europe and um then then they're used to oppress indigenous um uh racialized communities or then are used for other uh, for for policing purposes and etc um so in exposing the complicity we recently had the campaign um with the called the european citizens initiative which is a petition we create it's an official petition registered by the European Commission uh, where we demand that the EU stop trading with illegal settlements um, because the EU still allows uh, um, uh, business to be carried in the illegal settlements uh, and under international law this is a this is the illegal illegal but also the EU could you please clarify because the EU has a strong stand against settlements so why would they do business while they that's a great question. Uh, it's mm. just uh, it's just the ironies. I mean, uh, the hypocrisy the, of politics, the hi extreme hypocrisy and double standards. Like it can't be laid even much more flat than this. Yeah, and they recognize the illegality of the settlements, yet they profit from expulsion and stolen land, Palestinian stolen land. Uh, and th and this the ca this campaign was the demand we ask to align uh, EU law under international law, just to make sure that EU, um, the EU is not in violations of such crimes. But even that, this is impossible to enact or it's very difficult to enact because um, uh, this would be seen as accountability and this there's so much at stake for the EU when it comes to something like this. But we have seen that in other occasions, they're very quick to answer and in imposing measures and um, and the boycotts, like after Russia had invaded Ukraine, they had stopped uh, trade relations within seconds. They know how to apply international law when they want to. Uh, they know uh, an aggression when they see it. It's just that it's not strategic for them um, elsewhere. But it's a very difficult, like in calling out the double standards, and I think they see it, but uh, they still remain in power and they uh, don't choose not to uh, uh, carry on with it. I don't know if it's a, a promising uh, or positive <laughs> answer. No, I mean, that's the reality, sadly. I mean, it's, we, we're all aware. I mean, it's, we, we cannot really analyze. We know 75 years of uh, continuing Nakba for us Palestinians. I mean, regardless of what statements they issue or what uh, what the politicians say, it's the realities are on the ground are the same. We're continuing being this dispossessed, and the world is silent and complicit. Um, yes. I mean, it is. It's. I want to respect that you have another appointment, um, uh, Hanin. So, uh, I mean, it is. It's before I give you um, before we leave. I'd like to give you like some space for closing words. Um, so I am sorry this was short, but hopefully um, uh, uh, you were interested or if you look forward to or you want to be more involved and want to read more about our work, I invite you to uh, not just follow us on our social media, but maybe um, subscribe to our newsletters. We send out, we don't spam, first of all, and we send like really nice 
emails informative and uh, interesting. We also regularly like inform on events that we have going on. Um, and uh, uh, and if you want to carry out also a VR uh, tour on Palestine, feel free to get in touch with me. I'm happy to share uh, if Amar and Ryan like shared my email and that's possible and we can, I can walk you through uh, the steps if you want to organize an event, an interactive event, uh, something that is a bit different. Um, but yeah, I'm uh, sorry otherwise. Uh, <laughs> now we don't. I've never it. done a VR. Uh, does it uh, does it make you feel dizzy and? Uh, um, I mean, or... it depends. I think it depends uh, on the person, but um, yeah, I, I'm assuming that after a long time, anyone would feel dizzy. But if you, it's that's why it's shorter videos. It's not uh, for hours. So you should invite the European parliamentarians to use the VR. I think that would be very helpful. Next time. Yeah, we invited them. We they tried it out a few times. They liked it, um, yeah. but only the ones that were willing to to try it out. Hanin, um, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for the amazing work that you're doing. Um, amazing work is being done in Palestine, in all, in every part of uh, historical Palestine, but also amazing work is happening also in Brussels, in Washington, um, uh, by people like the people who are attending, but also like people like you. Keep up the good work. Inshallah, we will be in touch again. Thank you very much and enjoy your evening. We're giving you like 15 minutes of uh, break we usually finish on the hour so now just party go and have fun <laughs> enjoy <laughs>